Welcome to Software Quality Now. My name is Steve, and this channel focuses on the development of high-quality, mission-critical software. In today's video, we're going to begin looking at the quality and use model found in ISO slash IEC 25010 colon 2011, also known as Square. This is part one of a two-part series discussing the quality and use model. You will find a link in part two in the description. The International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC, have reached a consensus and created ISO slash IEC 25010 colon 2011, or SQUARE, a standard for systems and software quality requirements and evaluation. The standard was last reviewed and confirmed in 2017 and remains current. SQUARE defines two models, quality in use and product quality. These models define characteristics relevant to all software products and computer systems. These models have been decomposed into factors, with some of the factors further decomposed into subfactors. ISO slash IEC 25012 contains a complementary data quality model. The quality in use and product quality models do not provide a recipe for software quality. The factors and subfactors are like a checklist or a cheat sheet. They're reminders used throughout the software development process to ensure that everything has been considered. These factors and subfactors are guidelines for the identification of the properties of the system and the system's use by the enterprise. Each property should be quantifiable and measurable. Data is collected for each property, collated, and mathematically combined to arrive at a quality measure. The point of all this is, is that we are focused on values, concepts, and principles used to develop high-quality, mission-critical software systems. And knowing what constitutes quality is an important part of our job. Remember when I told you Square contains two models, quality in use and product quality? What the heck is that all about? Why, it's story time. My mother sewed dresses for my sister when she was a wee brat. She's an adult brat now. I can clearly remember being dragged to the fabric store on a regular basis, spending months at a time for the hour or so we were in the store. To this day, the smell of these places brings back memories. Oh, the horror. On the other hand, when my wife needs something from one of these places, I know exactly where to go for what she wants. She always looks at me with amazement when I say, oh, that's a notion, and they're over here, and I lead her to another part of the store. Once we got home, my mother would cut fabric on the kitchen table, then use the sewing machine to assemble the garment. Her artisanship was evident. I remember the compliments that my mother and my sister received when the brat wore one of those dresses. In fact, Others would ask my mother from time to time to make their little girl a dress. Now, at this point, you think I've lost my marbles completely. But no, no, there is a point to the story. A point just as sharp as my mother's shears. Something like the product quality model addresses my mother's artisanship, the selection of patterns, fabrics, shears, etc., the skill with which she cut the fabrics and sewed together the parts. Quality in use is akin to the inspection that the dress received from the church ladies when worn by my sister. Our focus should primarily be on the product quality because we too want to be artisans of a wildly different sort. If I see one of you in a meeting with scissors or a large sewing needle, I'll know there's a serious problem. Even so, we need to understand quality in use because it is a formal way in which the customer perceives the value of what we build. This two-part video series will focus on the quality in use model. The quality in use model identifies five factors that are utilized to evaluate the outcome of tasks being performed by stakeholders, 
using the services provided by a system when used. One, in the real world. Two, by real stakeholders. Three, in one or more contexts of use. In this video, I will be unpacking the when used clauses because they are loaded with meaning. We will look at the five factors in part two. But before I do the unpacking, I want to emphasize a subtle but crucial point. It's not just about the system and what it does or how it does it. The quality and use factors are used to evaluate the outcome of the overall human-machine interaction. The assumption being made is that the system is a means to an end, not the end itself. For example, imagine we are tasked with creating software for the self-driving feature of a vehicle. The software that implements the self-driving feature is there to assist the vehicle's passengers with getting to their destination safely. Evaluating the quality and use would not be restricted to simply the driver's interaction with the feature. It would also include how well the vehicle got safely to its destination. Now we can unpack the when used baggage. The first clause is when used in the real world. This means we are evaluating the system's use in situ. That's a fancy way of saying that this is not about testing the system. It's about evaluating the system as it is being used in daily life for the purposes intended, you know, for realsies. The second clause is when used by real stakeholders. There are three types of users with which we are primarily concerned. Primary users are those individuals who interact with the system to accomplish their primary goals. Secondary users provide support through their interaction with the system. Secondary users include those that load data into the system or administer and manage the system. Those individuals that maintain the hardware and software are also secondary users. The third type of user needs the output from the system but doesn't directly interact with the system. This could get complicated and confusing, so how about some real-life examples? Example number one, the electric company. I have electricity coming into my home provided by a power company. Isn't that shocking? I know I'm amped. That makes me a stakeholder, even though I don't have direct interaction with the systems that control the generation of that electricity and its distribution. I could use the quality and use factors to evaluate the services provided by that power company. There are myriad people who are responsible for getting the power to my home, including the executives that manage the company or companies involved, the customer service agents that answer the phones, the technicians that run the power plant, the meter readers, and the people that fix downed power lines after a storm. All those folks are part of the system from a stakeholder perspective. We could collect the data about the tasks that I perform related to my use of this utility and measure the quality in use. All those stakeholders use the system also. We could collect data about the tasks they perform and measure the quality and use of the system from their perspective. Example number two, the insulin pump. I am an insulin-dependent diabetic. Not to sugarcoat it too much, I use an insulin pump connected to a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM. It's amazing technology. Now, I'm a primary user of this system, using it to accomplish my primary goal, the management of a healthy blood sugar level. We could establish properties we want to measure, say, my blood sugar at specific times of day or after certain events to evaluate the quality and use of my insulin pump. The software engineers who develop the software embedded in the device, quality assurance folks, and my endocrinologist are secondary users. All those people are part of the system from my perspective, but they too perform tasks related to the system and we could measure certain aspects of their interaction. Sweet, right? 
Example number three, Amazon. I've been buying merchandise from Amazon since 1998. At first, I purchased books, but now I buy all sorts of merchandise. I'm a primary user, given that I use the app on my phone and the UI on my browser to accomplish my primary goal of buying merchandise. Searching for, purchasing, tracking shipments, and making returns are all tasks that I perform. It's pretty easy to imagine some properties we might want to collect data for and then measure the quality in use. Somewhere, there are people who could figure the system with merchandise, including the pictures, descriptions, and prices. Those folks are secondary users. I think that with those examples, I've beaten the stakeholders, I mean, uh, the subject of stakeholders to death. Let's move on to when used in one or more contexts of use. In most situations, our contexts of use do not include 1,000 monkeys and 1,000 laptops to randomly abuse our software system. Quality in use must be established as used by real, honest-to-God users in specific real-life situations. In other words, context of use. I've never had monkeys as honest-to-God users. My loss. Here is a selection of contexts of use, categories, and examples for each category. Context of use, category number one, user characteristics. I had a professor at the University of Maryland that taught a course on different programming languages. Trust me, unless you're in my neighborhood age-wise, you'll never have heard of most of these languages. Snowball or APL, anyone? Anyway, I brought him up because he wrote a book about user interface design and user characteristics were a memorable part of that book. I'm Unfortunately, I, I don't remember his name, but I sure do remember this concept. Here are some examples of user characteristics that might give you some ideas about how you measure quality and use. One, a novice user who has no experience with the system and little experience with the problem domain. Two, an occasional user who's an expert in the problem domain. Three, an experienced user who is an expert in the problem domain and in the use of the system. Four, a user with disabilities. Obviously, there are different disabilities that may require different accommodation. Quality and use measurements for these different types of user characteristics would only be relevant if requirements were specified to guide the design and implementation with them in mind. We'll return to user characteristics in just a moment. Context of use, category number two, tasks being performed. Naturally, measuring quality and use overall is measuring the outcome of the specific tasks being performed. This is straightforward at least if you're thinking about experienced primary users. But what about secondary users that configure the system or for customer service agents that provide support to primary users or those stakeholders who depend on the analytics or reports produced by the system but may not have direct system access? Quality and use can be measured for each task that is performed using the system directly or indirectly. Also, keep in mind the previous category, user characteristics, in combination with the tasks being performed. Let's use an example from health insurance, a problem domain I am professionally familiar with. Health insurance companies receive claims from doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers. While much of this adjudication process is automated, Someone must be available to make decisions about the claims and what's covered and how much is covered. That someone is a claims adjudicator. With that role in mind, would you want to measure the quality and use differently for an expert claims adjudicator versus someone who was just hired and has limited experience doing claims adjudication? What about someone who has claims adjudication experience? but has never used this system before. Another health insurance example is member registration. Members might self-register using an online system, 
Member registration might also be done by a customer service agent speaking with members by phone. It might also be automated using AI assisted by a clerk based on mail-in cards provided by new members. Measuring quality and use for member self-registration would be quite different from registration done by a customer service agent and different again if done using the mail-in cards. Context of use category number three, equipment. This one comes up a lot with mobile apps. Think about all those different devices. This is always an annoyance. It's important to remember that you might want to prevent any usage on some devices. For example, older model smartphones or tablets. Tasks might be restricted to employer-provided workstations due to security concerns. The functionality provided might differ if access is provided from a shared computer, such as one found at a library or internet cafe. I recently worked on a phone system that uses Amazon Connect. A browser is used to take or transfer calls. However, a smartphone or tablet browser cannot be used with Amazon Connect. This was an issue for the enterprise because they desperately wanted to be able to manage calls using enterprise-provided smartphones. So there are three categories of contexts of use. I'm sure we could come up with uh, more, but this is a good start. If you have some suggestions for new or different ones, leave a comment. Time to summarize. There are, are five factors in the quality of use model that are utilized to evaluate the outcome of tasks being performed by stakeholders using the services provided by a system when used in the real world by real stakeholders in one or more contexts of use. In the description, you'll find a link to Square Quality in Use Part 2 where we discuss each of those quality and use factors. This is Steve. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and comment, and subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming videos. Your support makes it possible for me to continue making these videos. See you for the next video on the Software Quality Now channel, where we focus on high-quality, mission-critical software development.